right, so Tchaikovsky the Elder and themes for authentic faith. That's where we are headed this morning. And some of these things probably already maybe make a little sense, gel to you, but uh, Tchaikovsky maybe not. So let's start there. Why on earth Tchaikovsky? Well, this may take a minute to come on, so we'll, we'll leave it there and see what happens. Um, talk into the microphone more. Talk into the microphone more. Um, so, as I was getting into 1 John and studying and reading and excited, I thought, well, this is going to work out well because we got five days, so we can kind of go a chapter a day. And as I start looking in and reading, I thought, I'm not sure that's going to work. And one of the reasons is because as you're reading 1 John, you see that uh, these themes keep coming back up. And so themes make sense. You're used to themes. And so where do we find themes? In Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, uh, comes to mind as an example of recurring themes. So if my technology will work, and that's a diff at the moment. Oh, yes it will. This is going movement by movement and showing how the recurring main theme comes in, the Tchaikovsky specifically. I think you'll see the instruments that carry the theme will flash up or two. scripture and thinking about how we approach a book of the Bible. Uh, there's some things that we need to know to really do good Bible study. We need to know something about the author when possible, something about the background, the context in which uh, you know this text was originally given, uh, something about the early hearers and so forth. So we want to do that, uh, kind of do that hard work so that we can really get as much as we can out of the text. So that's where the elder comes in. Um, who is the author of John? First John in this case. And the text actually doesn't directly tell us. So we need to do a little bit of extra work. You read First John, there are many similar literary features to Second and Third John, the books that follow. And in those books, the author identifies himself as the elder. So that's where we get the term the elder. Um, the same author is believed to have written the Gospel of John. Again, in the Gospel of John, there's not a very clear identification as John, but we have some really interesting things. So actually, before we get into the text of 1 John, I'm going to take us back to the Gospel of John, and I'm starting where? Uh, ah. Change my notes here. I'll say where I'm starting, right? Uh, starting in chapter 13. So if you will look with me at 13, starting 21, verse 21. 
After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, uh, I want to look. I think I want to look. Hold on. Recombobulating here. Yeah, that should be where I want to look. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I tell you that one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, here it is, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. So scholars often refer to the author of the Gospel of John as the beloved disciple, believing that when John says the one who Jesus loved, it's a self-reference, okay? So that actually shows up five times in the Gospel of John. Another one is chapter 19, uh, verse 25. You want to go there with me for a moment? Starting with verse 25. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and, here it is, the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. So just a couple of references there that show, okay, this is how the disciple referred to himself, the one whom Jesus loved. And if you do a few more uh, kind of gymnastics and studying here, Go to 21, we're not going to do that right now, but you'll find out that seems to be the son of Zebedee. Um, and then, you know, that kind of narrows it down to, to James and John. And there's other things that you can go through scripture to say, yes, this seems to be John. All right, so, Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, there's actually one more book attributed to this author. And if you want to participate, stand and yell, I'll bat it your way, then people will be kind and get the prize to you. What other book is attributed to John? Go. Hebrews. Ooh, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but that, that makes a good guess. Yes. Revelation. Revelation. I'm batting it your way, so it will help. Oh, good one. You all right? Okay, don't sue. All right. Yeah, Revelation, uh, which the author does. Uh, then a tribute to say, you know, hi, John. All right, so why is that all important? Well, as we get into this, um, we're going to see who is speaking when the author of the book we're looking at, uh, 1 John, is talking. Who is this? What is this person's background? Now, there is a little bit of debate among scholars to say, what John are we talking about? Church tradition will say, oh, well, we're talking about the Apostle John. Um, reason for that. Well, there's a person named Polycarp. And Polycarp was an early Christian. He was a pastor in Smyrna. You might recognize Smyrna from the book of Revelation. And Polycarp is attributed to be a disciple of the Apostle John. And Polycarp says he wrote those books. So it seems to be a pretty good witness to me. Um, that's where we'll go. So, um, where do we go from there? <coughs> the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, did John think that was exclusive? In other words, kind of, nan, nan, boo, boo, I'm the one Jesus loves, you know? Uh, no. How do I know that? Well, one reason is if we go back to 1 John, that's for study, so we'll go back and look at 1 John, we find out that uh, there are several references, and I'll let you, as you read 1 John, count them, maybe you can tell me uh, tomorrow in the coming days, how many times John calls his hearers, or his readers, beloved. So here we have the person who says, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved, over here saying to the followers, the believers, beloved. Um, this is a letter, or some people think it's kind of a written sermon. There's no other real literary structure to the whole book. Uh, but there is a, a structure of how the themes are organized. Which, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so it's important to see how does the text fall together, right? Because people later add the chapters and verses, 
but those don't always give us the best uh, the best understanding of the flow of the book. So here we have a prologue, which we will be getting to. Um, and then scholars say, well, you know, there's kind of two major sections. And uh, they begin with these terms. This is the message. So if you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 5. I'll give you a minute to get there while I get there. This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, in him there is no darkness. So then there, everything that follows that is going to kind of revolve around this kind of meta theme, okay? And the next one uh, is going to come in at 311, 311. And again, it will start, this is the message. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Then there is a conclusion, and we will spend time on the conclusion. It's very important. Um, this gives us an idea of kind of movements. So how many movements were in Tchaikovsky's symphony? Right there. Thank you. Trying to spill your drink <laughs> with the bowl. Yeah, four movements, and you know, it seems like that's also the case in 1 John. There seems to be kind of four uh, for movements of the book. So, who was John writing to? Well, so let's follow John's story just a little bit. Uh, if it is indeed the Apostle John, uh, John was after the resurrection of Jesus at some point, uh, taken into captivity, taken to the Isle of Patmos. You may be familiar with this story. Uh, is believed to have been boiled in oil, survived, and came back and pastored the church of Ephesus. So this may have been written to the Christians in Ephesus. Again, this isn't really identified in the text. But whatever the case, it is to an early group of believers, apparently in one location, and it seems that someone has left, like a group of people have left the church. And so John is writing to encourage the believers who remain. Um, who left? Well, again, it doesn't exactly identify, but based on several things that John says, uh, particularly in connection with who Jesus is, what we might call the incarnation, it seems that the people who left may have been called Gnostics. So that's why my silent G is there. It's like Nat, right? It's not Gnostics. The Gnostics. If that's the case, let's talk about who the Gnostics were for just a moment. In the Gnostic's mind, flesh, human flesh, like your body, and actually all matter is bad. It's all evil. And the spirit is good. And so the idea of the Gnostics was that there's knowledge. That's where Gnostic is related to the term knowledge. There's a knowledge you can have to kind of work yourself up uh, to God, but you know, your flesh is of absolute no use, your body's disconnected from all of that, and they actually split into two groups. One of those groups is, uh, was a, a group that said, you know what, we're gonna kinda let the flesh waste away, we're gonna kinda pay no attention at all, we're just going to be very spiritual. And the second group said, oh, well, you know what, if the flesh is bad, but we're kinda living it anyway, you know, just do what your body craves, and then you can kind of be spiritual over here. And so the second group obviously won a little bit more attention, right? That was a little easier uh, for people to follow. But in this idea, they did have to also deny what I just mentioned, this idea of incarnation, this idea that Jesus was actually God in a human body. Because the flesh is bad, so God can't really be in a human body. So obviously, uh, this would cause problems, this would cause division. And so the elder is writing to Christians, um, encouraging their faithfulness, encouraging them in the faith that they've already received and believe. Uh, and what an amazing thing. I mean, imagine for a moment sitting at the feet of the elder who was there walking dusty roads with Jesus, right? The elder who was there leaning 
his head on Jesus' chest. The elder who was a witness to the resurrection, who has been willing to lay down his own life and came near death for the faith, and is now testifying to the early believers and to us. That's who we get to listen to this week. Um, and to me, I, I have a hard time thinking who would be better to speak uh, into our lives about the faith. So, there are some people who will say, you know, this whole thing about Jesus being God in the flesh, people made that up later. That was kind of a later addition. But as I read John, I see he is very clear. So we're going to look at the prologue now, which is chapter one. Uh, by the way, I'm a reading person. I work with college students on uh, reading and delving into texts. And I can say something very important, especially as you move toward college reading. If you're reading a book, never skip the prologue. It's very, very important. Um, we'll start reading and then I'll, I'll gear off for just a moment. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That may ring a bell in some of your minds back to the gospel of John. Right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and then later uh, the Word became flesh and lived among us. Lived among us. Look here what he says. What we have heard, what we have looked at, what we have touched, right? This wasn't a distant experience. This was the Jesus that we, we were with in person, and this Jesus is this word of life who is God. So make no mistake, John has a very high view and understanding of who Jesus is, and at the same time a very practical and personal experience of who Jesus is. So, in verse 2, this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father, uh, and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Okay. So... John says, this is what I've experienced, right? I know myself to be loved by this God. I know myself to be the beloved disciple. I've seen, I've witnessed, I've experienced, but it's not just for me. To this early community who received this, it's for you too, right? This message is for you. This fellowship, this relationship isn't just for me and for those who, are, who you know, were the first people to experience Christ, it's for you. And then this word has been preserved because it's not just for John and it's not just for the early community of believers, it is for you. This week, my hope and prayer in everything you're doing, not just in chapel, but in your, in your devotion times, in your friendships, in, in walking across campus, in laying down at night, for that three seconds before you fall asleep, that you are experiencing exactly what John is talking about here. Because it is for you. In fact, John says his joy is complete when the, when the others experience the fullness of this. And again, for those who are believers, right, our joy is complete. When others come in, come to the table, come to have this fellowship, come to experience. And that's what we want to do as we, as we read the scriptures, but as we open our hearts to allow God to encounter us in our many areas of life this week. Will you open your heart to just say, I'm ready to encounter and experience God 
in continual and in new ways. And so with that, let's pray today. We will follow this into themes that John deals with. Um, so we'll talk about receiving the revelation, um, family affair, the fact that truth is lived out on a daily basis, and how God sustains us. But for today, let's stop where we are and let's pray. Lord, thank you for taking. Thank you for this time away from other things in the world. Thank you for this time that we have to focus in on you. And Lord, I pray that just like John encountered you uh, first walking along roads uh, in the Middle East with you, later in the Spirit, Lord, may we encounter you and may you encounter us. May we have this fellowship. May we be more aware of the fellowship that we have with you and then each other. I ask for your provision and your help, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to wait that I did bring avocado socks today. Yeah. All right. Have a great day.